So hi everyone, and welcome to Beginner's Kabbalah. My goal with this course is twofold. Number one is for some of you who are just getting exposed to or interested in uh, Kabbalah, the ideas, the concepts, I'm going to introduce some new concepts to you. And what's even more important to me than the concepts themselves is trying to figure out how these ideas can apply to our lives, especially our lives today, right now. Right now, I believe that we have an opportunity like we've never had before, at least not in my lifetime. And that opportunity is to actually seize a moment where the world has stopped. The world is going through a time that is allowing us to reflect, to ask ourselves very deep, very powerful questions that in a regular day we're not able to ask ourselves because we're all too busy in the rat race. The world forced us out of the rat race for a limited time. There's going to be a time soon that it's all going to start up again. And you know what? we may even forget about what's going on now. So while we're here and while we're going through the raw emotions, while we're dealing with this, and I'm gonna say special time in our lives, I wanna take advantage of it. I wanna take advantage of it and I wanna ask ourselves questions. So I'm going to blend in the next four weeks, a little bit of the concepts and ideas of Kabbalah, introduce you to it, but also, like I said, more importantly, really talk about it in a way that we can apply to our lives. What is Kabbalah? Let's start off with that. Kabbalah is the wisdom to realize and experience God in our world, in our world that can often seem as if it's godless. Kabbalah is first concerned with coming close to God, with coming close to the creator of the universe. And in order to come close to God, we have to intellectually comprehend the stages of the continual recreation of reality. At every single moment, says Kabbalah, the world is created anew. At every moment, our narrative, our reality is created anew. Just think about it this way. From Kabbalah's perspective, if God wanted to destroy the world, God would just stop creating it. So our lives, the way we view our lives, the way we look at our lives, our lives are created anew at every moment and we can decide at any moment to change that narrative. And even if a moment ago, your narrative was one that maybe you didn't agree with at this moment, you don't have to do anything. You just have to make that shift and change it. And that's it. Because like God is creating the world anew at every moment, we can create our lives anew at any moment. Let's just go through the history of Kabbalah and, and how it got to where we are today. So the roots of Kabbalistic tradition can be traced back to the ancient prophetic experiences of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, who are called the four bearers or the, our, our, our original ancestors. It was passed down to their children who were the 12 tribes of Israel. The wisdom that Moses received at Mount Sinai and later passed on to the Israelites, to his people, 
was comprised of both esoteric and exoteric elements. So the exoteric tradition, it's called nigla in Hebrew, which means revealed. It became identified as the focus of Jewish life, both in study and practice for generations. And it's this tradition that most Jewish scholars are familiar with. Their classic work of Jewish law, the Talmud, uh, the oral tradition, the Mishnah. And on the other hand, there was this esoteric tradition. They called it Nistar, which means hidden. And that was transmitted to only a select few in each generation. And it was suited for only those people who are, were able to dabble in its mysterious depths. Kabbalah was always the secret, the secret of Jewish mystical teachings. So like this, according to our tradition, the entire Torah was given at Mount Sinai through Moses to the Jewish people, both the written Torah and the oral Torah. The five books of Moses that we're so familiar with was written. It was called the Torah Shebiktav, the written law. And then there was an oral tradition. That oral tradition was passed down from teacher to students. So there was the written element, the Torah Shebiktav, that comprised the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. 24 books in all, known as the Tanakh. And then there was the oral tradition. The oral tradition was the Torah Shabbat Peh, as it's called in Hebrew. It refers to the laws, the explanation of the mitzvahs, of the mitzvot. God gave the written law to Moses, but you would never understand the written law without the elucidation and the understanding and the elaboration of the oral tradition. And only after the destruction of the temple and the dispersion of Jewish people were the Talmud and Mishnah recorded because the great Rabbi Yehuda Nasi and later Ravina and Ravashi, these great scholars were afraid that it would be forgotten because people were busy. So they, it was always oral, but the Talmud only was written because of the fear of it being forgotten. There's actually a book called The Ethics of Our Fathers, Perkei Avot, that gives the actual transmission of the oral law. It says that Moses received the oral law on Mount Sinai, passed it on to Joshua, the son of Nun, who transmitted it to the elders. The elders conveyed it to the prophets, the sages of their generation, and they communicated to the men of the Great Assembly, and that spanned 23 generations. So from Moses, we were able to see this direct line of oral tradition that spanned 23 generations. And you can see then from there, like for example, the elders that the Mishnah refers to were identified as either Caleb and Pinchas, or the judges who ruled after Joshua, which is according to Maimonides, or Pinchas, um, the, the, or El, and Eli the priest. Just to give you an idea, why I'm saying this is because this was a very clear transmission from one person to the next. The Torah was then passed through 17 generations of what we called Tanaim and Amarayim, which were Mishnaic and Talmudic authorities, after which the Babylonian Talmud was completed in Babylon and the Jerusalem Talmud was completed in the land of Israel. Then there was the Savoraim and the, Ga'on, and the Ga'onim, and they elucidated both Talmuds. They introduced decrees, they introduced regulations, and they took that all based basically, in order to create an elucidation, you had to start from the text of the written law, always starting from the text, and you had to move your way down the various traditions. So that way, everything was sourced in the written law. The oral law didn't exist on its own without the written law as its source. Then came the, what we call the poskim, 
They were scholars that were fluent in both written and oral law, and they would determine the halacha, the law. Now, in the last 950 years, the Rishonim and Acharonim, the early and late authorities, they've explained the Talmudic and the halachic literature that has preceded them, and this has been the process of continuing this tradition of the written and the oral law from one generation to the next. Now, at the same time that the oral tradition was being written down, that the Talmud was being written, there was also the homiletics, the Agadah, which we can talk about a different time, and the Midrash. There was a man by the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. His passing is going to be in a few weeks. And he was the first one to write down what was called the esoteric, the Nistar. Remember, Nistar was only for a few elite in a particular generation. No one knew it. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai knew it, and he decided to be the first one to write down. He called his magnum opus the Zohar. And there was always this fascination throughout history with this idea of the Jewish mystical teachings, otherwise known as the Kabbalah. Rabbi Shirin Bar Yochai himself has a fascinating story. He got in trouble with the Romans. He ended up hiding in a cave for 13 years. And there is where he wrote the Zohar. The Zohar, I would say, is the Bible of Kabbalah. It is the, 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 the magnum opus of Kabbalistic literature. Now, the problem with just opening the Zohar and studying it as is, is that it's very difficult without a tremendous amount of previous knowledge to be able to just open a Zohar. It's written in Aramaic. It's written in shorthand of shorthand. He, it was never intended as a book for people just to sit and study. It was for people who were proficient in all of the studies to be able to look at that and they would see the, the Nistar, the esoteric ideas. It's complicated. And what ended up happening with the the continuation from the Zohar is that the, the major post-Zoharic influence was a man by the name of Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. He was known as the Arizal. He lived in Sifat about 400 years ago. So for many years, the Zohar was still to the great elite. The writings of his pupils, especially his main pupil, whose name was Rabbi Chaim Vital, they have been the writings that have nourished Kabbalists, Hasidim, the Sephardic communities. Originally, the Zohar and mysticism were not studied before the age of 40. And even after great soul searching, after mastering all the other texts, but the Arizal decided that, as he said, with the messianic era upon us, these doctrines must be revealed. And therefore, this began a new way of learning Kabbalah, that anyone and everyone can learn it. But even in the times of the Arizal, people still did not study Kabbalah the way it's being studied today here on Zoom and open and accessible for all. What happened was about 300 years ago, there was a name, a man by the name of Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. Now, a Baal Shem was like a doctor, a healer. There was many different types of Baal Shem. So this was a specific Baal Shem. His name was Rabbi Israel Baal Shem. And he lived right after a time called the Chemel Niki Pogroms. You can look it up. The Chemel Niki Pogroms were the Polish army had gone after the Russians. And the Russians came back with the pole, at the Poles with a vengeance. And as the Polish army retreated from the Russians back into Poland, they literally killed out town and townlet of Jewish life. At that time, it's 300 years ago, a little over 300 years ago, majority of Jewish life in Europe was devastated. Now, there was a division amongst 
the European Jews. There were the educated, which means if you were wealthy, then your father would assign a teacher for you and you would study and you knew. Or there was sometimes a brilliant child who the community would raise funds for and they would send him to yeshiva in order for him to later become the rabbi of the town. That's how they would be able to get a rabbi. This was common. And so majority of the people were uneducated. And now think about it for a moment. There is an entire or whatever is left of the Jewish people of Europe, majority of them lost all their family or most of their family, and they're devastated and they're uneducated and they have no answers. If they were educated, they would have gone back to their studies. They would have gone back to the Torah. They would have gone back to the Talmud and they would have understand. They would have understood what was going on in the world. They would have understood all of what was happening, that there was something higher, there was a God, there was greater. But these were simple people, uneducated people who were completely faithful. They weren't people who abandoned the faith. They were very faithful, but they had a lot of questions and they had no one to answer these questions. So at the time, people didn't ask questions. You just did what you were told. The rabbi told you what to do and you did it. No one asked any questions. And here, they couldn't understand why God could do something like this to them. How could God create a situation where they would lose most of their family? How could bad things happen to good people? They lost great sages, scholars, rabbis. So they just became disbelievers. They fell apart. They had no purpose. They had no meaning. They had nothing. And so this Baal Shem Tov, this healer, a young man, started traveling the countryside, telling stories, teaching, until he realized the stories weren't enough, the teachings weren't enough. He needed to teach something deep, something that would give the people a reason to live, to bring back their identity, to bring back their purpose of living again, to live as they lived before, before they lost their families, before they lost their communities, before they lost everything. And so he started teaching the Kabbalistic concepts, something that was only for scholars, something that was only for people above 40. He started teaching the whys of the world, the purpose behind everything. And that changed. And later, that was passed on to his successor, the Magad of Mezrich, and then to Rabbi Shner Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, and so on and so on until we are here today, nine generations after the Baal Shem Tov. And we're able to, it's, it's, it's so spread and so out there in a way that I, that, I mean, through technology, in a way that who could ever imagine how how amazing it spread out. So what I'd like to do over the next four weeks is I'd like to dabble into the Kabbalah. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to decide for yourself. I think that it will speak for itself. The ideas will speak for themselves. But more importantly, I want to look at this as a direction, as a way for you to be able to self-reflect through various elements and aspects of your life. Ask yourself difficult questions. I'm hoping that because you have the time now that you'll be able to think about some of these ideas that we're gonna talk about. And you're going to be able to maybe create a journal if you're a writer, or create voice notes if you're a speaker, or create ex meditations, experiences, whatever way that you can work on yourself and allow this to not just be something that's intellectual, but something that becomes emotional as well. Before we get into our topic tonight, which is the Kabbalah of love and relationships, I wanna just give you a couple of Kabbalah facts. 
Number one, how, how do we unite heaven and earth? How do we unite the soul and the body? How do we unite the mind and the heart? How do we integrate the sacred and the mundane, the spiritual and the material? So according to Kabbalistic tradition, the entire purpose of creating this world, that God created this world. How long did it take God to create the world? Six days. And then God rested on the seventh. And the entire purpose for which God created this world was because God had what we call a taiva. God had a desire, a spiritual lust, to have a dwelling place in the lower realms. God wanted a dwelling place in the lower realms. That is the entire purpose for which this world is created. And you're, we're going to talk about this over and over again because you're going to see how everything that happens in our world and in our lives have some kind of connection to this idea of dira b'tachtonim, of a dwelling place in the lower realms. A dwelling place in the lower realms is a goal which achieves the fulfillment through channeling of the divine light into progressively denser vessels of human thought, of human feeling, and of deed, and then into the rest of the world. So what God, let's, we're just using metaphor. We have no choice but to use metaphor. What God did was, let's say God is all-encompassing light. Let's pretend like, let's say the sun. The sun is not God, but we're just using a metaphor. God is this light. God had to create these dense vessels to be able to hold. Now, if God's light, this world could not hold it. Actually, God tried creating this world with pure light, but it was zapped into oblivion. Of course, this world, the material world couldn't hold it. So there has to be this filtering process for which the great light is slowly, slowly, slowly less and less and less and less until it can be able to be in this world. So it's called symptom. That's the process that Kabbalah calls this densing of the densering of the vessels, if that's a word. And by working within the realm of mundane consciousness and contemplative tradition, we're able to sensitize ourselves to the infinite divine nuance within creation. There is a way, a very deep level, but there's a way to see the divine spark even in the most mundane things, even in a table, in a chair. There's a divine spark in everything. Remember, if God wanted to destroy the world, God would just stop creating. So there's a divine spark in everything. And this is the historical, unique understanding of reality that we've had, just didn't have access to. And it, it represents this legacy of both prophecy and wisdom. Actually, interestingly enough, one of the ways of studying the Torah is a process called gematria. Every single Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent. Kabbalah, the numerical equivalent of the word Kabbalah is 137. It's equal to the combined value of the words chachma, wisdom, which is 73, and nevua, prophecy, which is 64. So wisdom and prophecy, wisdom being 73, Prophecy being 64, add up to 137, which is Kabbalah. So through the wisdom of Kabbalah, we learn to hear that which our ancestors envisioned at Sinai. And once we fully comprehend the conceptual significance of that vision, we're once again able to see God but with our routine senses intact. And not only for a moment, but for more than a moment. So that's my introduction. Now I want to get into the Kabbalah of love. I'm going to start by asking 
some contemplative questions. If you have a pen and paper in front of you or you have your computer or your phone and you wanna take notes, um, what I'd like you is more than just taking notes on what I'm saying. Take notes on how this lands within you. Take notes on what are your thoughts? What are your reactions? So what I'm gonna do in this process is I'm gonna speak slowly. And the reason why I'm gonna speak slowly is to give you the opportunity for whatever I'm saying to land and to see how you react and how you feel. And at the end of our lesson tonight, I love to hear how, what, what your reflection is and what you're taking out of this. So I'm gonna do it through a process of asking questions. The first series of questions is, who do we love? Who do we love more than anyone else? More than anything else? What is our greatest relationship? Our greatest love as human beings? I think something that I've realized and maybe I've taken for granted, something I've realized through this past six weeks is how important relationships are. We so often take our relationships for granted. They're just there, it exists. But being isolated and being not allowed to have those relationships, it forces us to think about the power of relationships and what it means for our lives. So I'm asking, what is our greatest love as human beings? My answer is probably not the answer you were thinking, but the obvious answer, ourselves. There is no one, no thing we love greater than ourselves. There is no one who is going to love me more than me. I love myself. I will always love myself. I actually have a double standard when it comes to me. I judge the whole world, but I'll never judge myself. And even, oh my gosh, could you believe what that one did and what this one did? Everyone else becomes second class compared to me because I'm the greatest thing that ever existed. I must be God's gift to humanity, of course. So before we understand what love is, we need to understand who we are. Who am I? Because to love another, we need to love ourselves first. Because if I don't love myself, which naturally should be the first and foremost love, how do I expect to love anyone else? How do I expect to love anything else? One of my favorite quotes is from Ethics of Our Fathers, from Pirkei Avot, chapter one, Mishnah 14, it says, Rabbi Hillel used to say, if I am not for me, who will be for me? And when I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, then when? It's really easy. It's really easy to blame your mom, to blame your dad, to blame your dog, to blame your past relationships for the problems that you're currently having but that would be too easy and you know it. It's really all about you and it begins and it ends with you. It's best to say it right here and right now and say it to yourself. I need to use this moment as the starting point for the change that I want to see. This is it, this is an opportunity. You're gonna look back at this time and you're gonna say, ah, I didn't seize it. This is your opportunity. Right now, you're never gonna have a time in your life like this. COVID-19 is never coming back. We're all gonna be fine. 
and well very soon, this is your opportunity right now. It's about you and it begins and it ends with you. I think that our society has become completely desensitized to love. We push it under the carpet. We think that romance, that passion, that excitement, that's what love is. That's not love. Love seems to be this scary four letter word that's used so often and has no meaning. I mean, it's such an abused word. Let's think about it. As often as we use it to describe our relationships, we use it to describe our affection for objects. We love our new cars. My kids love chocolate ice cream. People say, I love how you decorated your home. I just love what you did with the place. I love the way you make me feel. I love your sweater. It can go on and on and on. It's the same word. It's the same love. What does that mean? Love. I mean, commercial advertising perpetuates the abuse by correlating love with whatever they want you to buy from them. I love what you do for me, Toyota. Not a paid for advertisement. Popular love songs. They abuse their love by not providing any substantive meaning to love. So even though maybe we can catch a little meaning out of love, I say if we love everything, we really love nothing. If we love everything, then we really love nothing. I mean, how can the same word that describes my relationship with my dog, if I had a dog, be applied to my relationship with my wife? How can the same word that describes my relationship with my wife refer to my relationship with my mother or my daughter or my grandmother? When I was preparing for this class, I took a quick look at romance languages. I figured that there, there's gotta be a better word than love in another language. So in Spanish, they use the passive language, and I'm gonna mess it up for you Spanish speakers, me gusta, which means it pleases me, to describe liking something, like liking chocolate or liking dancing. But when you speak of loving a person, you use an active verb, amor, la amor, to love. So, which is interesting and not something I'll be able to get to tonight, but in Kabbalah, there's a big difference between active and passive speaking. And in our language, I'll just give you one example, just in our lives, People say, can't, I won't, I can't, I can't. That's a passive conversation. Active conversation is, yes, I can. And, and it's much more than just the lexicon. On a deeper level, the problem with the word love suggests a confusion with loving as a much broader cultural phenomenon. That's not love. So... Tonight, let's try to see if we can take some of these Kabbalistic secrets and apply them to love. We're starting to think about who am I? How to love ourselves. We can't love ourselves. We can't love someone else unless we love ourselves first. And then hopefully as a result of starting to think about loving ourselves, we can understand how to love someone else. Let's go back to who am I? Your identity begins with your personal narrative. The story you tell yourself about yourself, your narrative, how do you look at yourself? What is the story? 
If you had to narrate your life, how would you narrate it? Try it. Little activity for you. Tomorrow, go around like you're a sports announcer and narrate everything you do. And listen to yourself. Ask, ask yourself, how am I narrating it? What is the, the way, the, the, the style of a speech that I'm using to tell the story of my life as it's going on? But the story that you tell yourself is not a story that's just told. It's a story that is felt. You are the embodiment of that story and you're the person telling it. So if you don't know that story, if you don't know that narrative, if you don't know the story that you're telling yourself, you need to make sure to get in touch with that story. It's so important. It's so important that it just seems like life just passes us by and we don't know what happens. Where did the days go? Where did the months go? Where did the years go? So I'm just encouraging you for one day to narrate your story. Make sure, and that narration of that story is going to take these intellectual ideas and bring them down to your emotions because you're going to start feeling something. And if you're someone who has a difficult time feeling, that's going to be great. If you're someone who doesn't have a difficult time feeling, well, you may feel something different. Now that we know who we are, or not we know who we are, that's a big, we're asking maybe better questions than we asked yesterday. Now that we're asking better questions, let's ask the next question. Is love important to you more than just the word? Is the emotion of being loved One of the hardest things throughout this process of quarantine was before Passover, I saw a bunch of people putting uh, pictures of their Seder for one. And Seder for me was always about as many people as possible, as big as possible, because we have to all be together. That's the story of Passover, being together. And so people who this year had no choice but to be alone, that, that loneliness, it definitely hit me emotionally. I don't know if it hit them because it was just their reality. But when I saw that, I just felt a certain sadness because I could never imagine being alone. I don't think I've ever been alone for a night in my life. Thank God. I, that loneliness is such a difficult thing for me, but maybe for others it's not. So I, it really struck me that we need relationships. We need others. So do you long for relationships? Do you long for love? The, the intimate soul, the intimate touch of another soul is, I believe, the most powerful anecdote for the all too human experience of loneliness. It may be the, the most compelling and pleasurable experience there is. So why do we spend so much of our time, so much of our energy avoiding intimacy, avoiding love by being angry, by being critical, by being closed, by being judgmental? In short, blocking the experience that we most deeply want, that we most deeply need. We play a double standard with ourselves. We want to be close. We want to be embracing. We want to be connected, but then we judge. We judge something or someone. Someone comes our way and we judge them. But it's there for us to experience. It's there for us to love. It's come into our path for a purpose. There's a reason why we've had to go through this experience. 
And we have such a difficult time accepting it that we have to destroy it. One of the classic examples that I can give you is, is thank you. People say thank you. It's such a thank you. What does that mean? It's, it's also lost its meaning. It's interesting. In Yiddish, when someone says thank you, you follow with the following statement. This can't, I think it comes from the shtetl. I'm not sure exactly where it comes from. But you say, they say a dank. You say a dank. You say, ah, nishta kein farvas, which means nothing to thank. Thank you. Ah, nothing to thank. It's like this humility, this false humility. Nothing to thank. I mean, that was the traditional flavor of the shtetl. It's terrible. Somebody just thanked me for something that I did. And I say there's nothing to thank. There is something to thank, and that's why they're thanking. It's almost like me saying, what are you worth? You went out of your way to thank me? Eh. I have to accept your thank you. What's your thank you? I need to embrace your thank you. No, what I'm going to do, I'm going to destroy your thank you. You did a good thing. Now it's time to destroy it. And that nishta came for us, nothing to thank. It destroys such a, an amazing relational element and a relational idea. What we just said there is your thank you is worthless. And what do we think? Oh, what I'm humble. What I was saying is really, I was, I was giving you an example of humility. Ah, it was no big deal. That's something else people say. Well, maybe it was a big deal. And maybe even if it was no big deal for me, it was a big deal for the person I did it for. Kabbalah says that is false humility. That's false humility. That's not what humility is. Humility isn't, for example, when someone says thank you, you say there's nothing to thank. Because that destroys the person who was saying thank you. That's deflection, not humility. There are so many examples of humility. I'm going to take a look right now at four biblical prototypes. Kabbalah always starts by looking at the, at the Torah. And this is a beautiful little sicha from the Rebbe. It talks about this idea of humility. Now, there was a man who lived somewhere between Adam and Noah. So there were 10 generations between Adam and Noah. And so this was actually smack in the middle, fifth, five, the generation five. His name was Hanoch. He was the great, great, great grandfather of Noah. And he came into this world, a, a corrupt world, and he wanted nothing to do with it. The Torah uses these words to describe him. He walked with God. He was a holy person, very connected to God, not to this world. He said, you and me, God, forget about all those sinners. Just me and you. So God said, oh, you and me? Okay, what did God do? He took him from this world early. Most people during that time were living the six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. He lived to the relatively young age during that time period of 365. And the rabbis ask, the Kabbalistic masters ask, why so young? And the answer is because he was selfish. Remember, what is the purpose for which God created this world? For us. For you and me to be here and to make this world a dwelling place for God. If he said, forget about this world, it's just you and me, God. If he has no connection to this world, then he missed the entire point of being in this world. The purpose of us being in this world is to make this world a good place, to make this world a place for God, not to bring this world to a different state, not to spend our time removed from this world. That is not true spirituality. It's not about being removed and trying to find spirituality somewhere else. We have to be in this world, be within this world and uplift it. That's our job. We have to make this world holy. That means, for example, to take the trees from the earth 
and to take the sulfur from the earth and put it together and make a book with which we can study. What did we do with that? We took this tree and this sulfur and we elevate it. The tree is now higher than a tree because before we did that, the best it could be was the best tree it could be. But when we cut it down, we would think, oh, if we were tree huggers, we'd say, that's terrible. Why'd you cut down that tree? Cutting down the tree seems to be a terrible thing, destroying God's world, but it's not true. Because what we did is we took that tree and we took the paper and we elevated the paper to a higher level than it could be itself. The apple may die of old age, but by taking that apple and using the energy that we get from eating that apple and making this world a better place, we were able to elevate that apple to a higher level than it could ever be itself. And so on and so on with everything in this world. And so our purpose is to elevate this world. So Hanoch was selfish. He didn't want to elevate this world. He didn't want to make this world a place for God. The second prototype is Noah. Now we know the story of Noah. Selfish or selfless? Think about it. Selfish or selfless? Well, let's understand Noah. Noah built an ark. God saved all of humanity through Noah. How long did he take to build the ark? The Torah says it took 120 years to build the ark. Now, there's one element of the story that we missed, and that is God said, build the ark so that all of humanity can come with you on the ark. You have 120 years. He didn't say take 10 years to build the ark. He said you have 120 years to build the ark. Think about it. You have 120 years to build the ark. You think in 120 years, he couldn't get one person to come with him on the ark? One person. He said to them, the flood is coming. God is going to destroy the world. He couldn't get one person. So the Rebbe says that the reason is because all he cared about was his family. He didn't really care about the world. He just wanted to get his family onto the ark. My family, he said, is going to perpetuate the world. The new world will be through my family. And so they did. So is he selfless or selfish? He's selfish because our families are an extension of ourselves. So when we do something for our family, we're doing something for an extension of ourselves, which makes him selfish. Now, it's not like Hanoch being completely selfish, being alone, but it's another form of selfishness. Prototype three, Abraham. Abraham, selfish or selfless? Think about it a second. Selfish or selfless? What does he do? He sets up a tent in the middle of a desert. It's open on all four sides, right in the middle. It's an oasis. The wayfarers are going by. He gives them food and clothing and shelter free of charge. Selfish or selfless? I mean, that's pretty selfless. And there's nowhere else to get. It's not like he has any competition. He's in the middle of nowhere. But there's a little trick there he has. So the person comes in. Abraham, wow, this is amazing. The oasis in the middle of a desert. This is unbelievable. He just finished giving them a great meal. They had a great night's sleep. They turn to Abraham and say, how much do I owe you? He says nothing on one condition. It's conditional. I want you to thank my God. So they turn to him and say, well, I don't want to thank your God. I have my own gods. Okay, a million dollars. It's blackmail. Now, we have monotheism today because of him. So it was blackmail with a cause. 
I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not here to judge Abraham and to judge what he did, but this is how he did it. This is how he started spreading monotheism. He blackmailed these people into praying to, to God. Abraham did his job and he was selfless, but selfless to a selfish cause. Not like Hanoch and not like Noah. He's selfish to God. So there's a selflessness there. It's a different, it's a, it's a higher level of selflessness. But still, there's a selfish element to it. Because there's a catch to it. Now let's look at the fourth prototype. Moses. Moses. The great Moses. Selfish or selfless? Well, Moses becomes our prototype for selflessness. Why is he selfless? He's selfless not because he said, oh, I'm too humble for that. Oh, nishta came for us, nothing to think. He didn't say, oh, I can't go take the Jews out of Egypt. I'm a nobody. How could nobodies take the Jews out of Egypt? That's not what he said. Because it's not selfless saying that I can't do that because I'm a nothing. There's a story told in the shtetl about these two yeshiva students who are late night, they're, they're sitting on either ends of the study hall, screaming, oh, I'm a nothing. And the other one's screaming, oh, I'm a nothing. And the other one is screaming, oh, I'm a nothing. This young student walks in and sees these two older students screaming on either end of the study hall, late at night, oh, I'm a nothing. He sits down in the middle, with all his passion and might and excitement, he says, oh, I'm a nothing. The two of them look at each other and he say, he's really a nothing. So that wasn't the selflessness of Moses. What did he say? He said, God, you told me to go take the Jews out of Egypt. I will go, but I just want you to know this. I am not the right guy for the job. If somebody else were given my job, they'd be doing a much better job than me. But you gave me the job and I'll do it. Think about it a second. I will do the job that you give me, God. But if someone else was doing it, they'd be doing a better job than me. That is the Torah's and Kabbalah's ultimate level of humility. I'm going to do what I have to do in this world. But I'm not the best person for the job. But I'll do it. God, I'll do the best I can, Moses says. I can't speak. I can't talk. I have a stutter. I can't do anything. I'm not charismatic. I'm just a simple guy. But if you want me to do the job, I'll do it but I just want you to know I'm not the best person for the job. And that's humility. Humility in our world, in our lives, is about the little Moses inside of us. There's another voice that says, why are you doing this? You're a little nothing. And the little Moses inside of us says, I will do the best I can with the talents that I've been given. I will do the best I can with the education that I have. I will do the best I can with the resources that I have. But let me tell you, if someone else was in my shoes, they'd be doing much better than me. But I'm still going to do the best I can. I will still move forward. I will wake up in the morning with excitement, with love, and with passion. I will conquer the day with the most incredible enthusiasm that I could give to this day. Because this day is the best day that I've ever been given. And thank you, thank you, God. Humility. Humility is doing the best we can with the talents we have. We can't control others, but we can control ourselves. Now let's go to the opposite of humility. Ego. Ego stands for edging God out, ego. The ego does not have the power to love. The ego can love, 
how another person makes it feel, but it's not able to love. The, our ego-based identity plays a very important role in human life, but it doesn't have the power to love. Ego is all about the self. It can, and it does experience need. And need is often mistaken for love, but it's not love. The ego can love how another person makes it feel. A lot of people get into relationships seeing what they can get out of it. The ego says, how are you gonna make me happy? True love and intimacy doesn't come from ego. In order to experience the power of true love, you have to get in touch with a different part of yourself, the part that lies beyond the ego. Think about it. We so often ask, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? I is the only letter in the English language that's always capitalized. I, it's the only letter in the English language that's, all, it's a, that's really only a word. It's all about the capital I. The whole world was created for me. It's all about me and my problems. If I'm gonna be in a relationship with you, huh, that's not I, that's you. I'm going to be in a relationship with you, then it has to be for me, then I have to get something out of this relationship. I'll give you another challenge. Try for one day this week to be conscious of your eyes. How many times you say I every day or that day? How many times you say I in just one conversation? Just a little challenge for you. Now, let's go back to the ego. The ego doesn't really exist. Although it functions as if it's the most real thing about you, in actual fact, your identity is only a perspective. It's kept alive solely through the stories that you tell yourself about life, about yourself, and about others. You can literally say your ego is all talk. It's an incessant monologue, and its sole purpose is to reinforce your false sense of self, who you are and who you aren't. Most of the time, it goes something like this. I'm better than he is, uglier than she is, smarter than him, richer than her, worse than I should be. I could do this with me. I could never do this. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't be that way. Life is good. Life is hard. He's right, she's wrong, I'm great, I'm no good. It's my fault, it's their fault, and on and on and on and on. It's a false identity. Because what we're doing at that moment is we're defining ourselves based on external circumstances. It's like a whale that identifies its location through bouncing sound waves off nearby objects. Your ego pinpoints its own presence by defining itself, by relating to the people, the ideas and the objects around it. And this process is continuous. Your identity must be continuously reinforced or you're quite literally lose your sense of who you are. One of the great things that they used to do in the old country, everyone, I think in Canada, we have Nufi jokes. Well, in the old shtetl, they had what was called chelm jokes. Chelem was actually the place where all the great scholars came from. But I guess that was the reason why they made so many jokes about it. So here's a Chelem joke for you. There was once a, a Chelemite who didn't want to go to the bathhouse because he was afraid that if he took off his clothes, he'd forget who he was. So his friend says to him, Beryl, I have an idea for you why don't you tie a string around your foot? That way, even if your clothes aren't on, you can look down and you remember who you are with the string. He says, wow, what a brilliant idea. 
So he ties a string around his foot. He goes into the bathhouse. He's all excited. He hadn't gone to the bathhouse before. He's coming out of the bathhouse, out of the, the pool. And he looks down and he sees the string is gone. And he looks at his friend and he sees that his friend has a string around his foot. So he turns to him and he says, if you're me, who am I? And I think that's why it can be so very threatening to have someone or somebody confronting your ego, confronting your beliefs about yourself. Because the ego is actually made out of these self-beliefs, out of these perspectives, out of these narratives, out of these opinions. And you identify the ego as you. So when your beliefs are threatened, it can feel just like that. But it's not really you. It's not you being threatened. So you think that you're threatened and it's based on your very survival, quite simply. The more you get to be right about things, the more real and solid you feel. And the more you're wrong, the more threatened and diminished you feel. So we're like the whales. We're bouncing our lives off the world, not exactly sure where we go, taking opinions like surveys as we go along. Oh, well, that person said I look nice. I must look nice. Oh, that person you know, said something nice to me. And literally, we just wait for that next accolade or that next moment. If I'm having a good day, it's because someone said something nice to me. If I'm having a bad day, someone said something not nice to me. That's not foundational. That's not grounding. I mean, if we're going to bounce our sonar off everyone around us, instead of just embracing, instead of just embracing each experience, each moment, each environment. So let's just say for a moment, what if we were able to say, I'm not a part of yourself. I'm not a product of social conditioning. I'm a balanced, I'm a grounded person. I'll definitely take my life experience but I'm not going to show it on my forehead. I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it in a bag, nice cloth bag, and I'm going to tie a string around it and I'm going to put it over my shoulder and I'm going to carry it with me because I don't want to make the same mistakes again, but I'm not going to wear it on my forehead. I'm not going to allow it to decide the way, the narrative of my life. I have a new narrative starting today. And my narrative is gonna be a narrative that is concrete, that is foundational, and it's not based on others, not necessarily based on experience. It's based on something strong. It's a core identity. There's a psychologist, you can look him up, his name is William James, and he called the story that you tell yourself the me and your embodiment of the experience, the I. Everything you experience, whether it be positive, negative, shame, an urge to escape, or even an impulse to yell, will not only be lived and felt by you, but narrated by you, to you in real time. So there's two facets of your identity. And these two facets of your identity are critical for understanding who you are. There is your core identity and your relational identity, says Kabbalah. What's your core identity? Your core identity is the spectrum of characteristics that define you as an individual. It includes everything from your body, your personality, your occupation, your spiritual beliefs, your cultural practices. The world would spin into chaos if we didn't have a core identity. Could you imagine no culture, no names, no personalities? Your core identity is the platform 
from which you synthesize your experience into a coherent sense of self with both continuity and clear ideals. Should you feel confused about your identity? If you feel unsure about who you are or what you stand for, then decisions of all kinds become problematic. That's why I don't think it's a good idea to raise kids without identity. There was a whole um, uh, thing that was going on. Oh, don't give them any identity. They'll figure out when they get older. Kids need identity. And, and this gets us into the multiplicity of identity. Your core includes your personal preferences, your personality traits, as well as your identification with a particular group, a social group. Do you see yourself as a Canadian, as an Israeli, as a Jew, as a secular humanist, an atheist, whatever it is, as a student, as a child, a parent, a business person, a liberal or conservative? Because you belong to multiple groups, you have multiple social identities. <clears throat> you can be a Canadian, Israeli, Jewish teacher and a liberal. But when it comes to life, when it comes to how you view your relationships, you have to decide which of your social identities to prioritize. You may feel competing loyalties based on your faith, based on your ethnicity or your political convictions or your national citizenship. Maybe your religious identity feels most important to you but you emphasize your national identity to fit in with your friends. And even in casual conversation with a friend, you have to decide whether to discuss politics, religion, or work responsibilities. And with each discussion shaping the contours of your identity, that's not your core identity. You can't keep on changing your identity to, to, for the relationship or just to kind of fit in with whatever you're doing in your society. And just as you identify yourself as a member of a specific group, others pigeonhole you. If you are the only Jewish, Israeli, Canadian executive in your company's meeting on cultural diversity, colleagues are gonna make you feel very aware of that identity. You may even misconstrue that as anti-Semitic. It may fall out of your awareness completely while you're meeting a friend and your guard is down, or you're just having a casual coffee. The most meaningful aspects of your core identity are what I call the five pillars of identity. And they are the following, identity, beliefs, rituals, allegiances, values. Beliefs, ritual, sorry, beliefs, rituals, allegiances, values, and emotionally meaningful experiences. I think this is the best way to understand who am I. So remember, the, the primary function of your identity is not to just stay alive. It's not just to pass along your genes or to settle down. I hate that word. But the, to attempt to find meaning, to find purpose in your life. And meaning begins with me. So, beliefs. What are they? Beliefs are your convictions. They're your principles. They're your morals. Think about, and I, it's number one, and they are in order. Beliefs are, are most important. Very often we get them from childhood. And if we didn't have them in childhood, then we have to create them as adults. We need to have a belief in something, someone, somehow. We need to have convictions. We need to have principles. We need to have morals. Number two, rituals. Rituals include your meaningful customs, ceremonial acts, whether it's holidays, prayers, Shabbat, or just a dinner with the family. It's so important. And I think that's such a great time right now to create family rituals. Families are spending more time together than ever before right now. It's a great opportunity. And even if those rituals using technology are through Zoom, that's also okay.
but we need to have rituals, real rituals. Number three, allegiances. Allegiances are the deep loyalties that you feel towards God. The loyalties you feel towards a family member, a friend, an authority figure, a person, a place, a thing. That's allegiances. Then there's values. Values represent your ideals. Your ideals must be explicit. They must be direct and not vague. They can't be fluffy. They can also embody a memorable narrative. For example, just not that long ago, the value of the redemption told in the Exodus of Egypt was a value that we conveyed as a ritual sitting around our tables. And then number five, emotionally meaningful experiences. These are the intense events, positive or negative, that define a part of your identity. They comprise everything from the day you uttered your first word, the day you learned to walk, to the moment your parents slapped you, to the memory of a terrible act, or even COVID-19. The first time you heard about the Holocaust, the first time you heard about genocide to a people. It's a very important place because those emotionally meaningful experiences, they do define a lot of our core identity. I put it as number five on my list of five, but they cannot be ignored. Now, I wanna tell you that your core identity will often be resistant to change. If you wanna stay true to your beliefs, if you wanna stay true to your rituals, to your values, then generally your core identity is going to become stubborn. It's gonna become set in its ways. So, if you, wanna, if you want to define or change your core identity, you need to first acknowledge what is before you acknowledge what you wanna change. You must allow yourself to acknowledge where you are, that personal narrative, narrate your life, spend the time, go through these five, make a list of where you are. Don't try to make a list of where you're going until you have a list of where you are. And then we get to the second part, the relational identity. Your relational identity is the spectrum of characteristics that define your relationships. When interacting with a significant other, at times you're gonna be distant, at times you're gonna be closer. You're constrained to be as free as you really are. If you think about your past relationships, especially those in your life that were longer than six months. Ask yourself a very important question. Was I ever or am I ever able to be myself? Did or do I feel stifled? Do I feel constrained? Was I able to develop an emotional closeness with a person? Now, when, while your core identity seeks meaning in existence. Your relational identity seeks meaning in coexistence. It changes constantly as you develop the nature and connection of your relationship. It means that you have a tremendous power to mold and to shape it. Think of the differences of identity in your relationships. You're able to have a core identity that remains distinct. Yet when it matters, you're able to use your relational identity to perceive who you are in relation to others and how they perceive you or how they are in relation to you. How do you feel connected? How do you feel rejected? There's really no quantitative measure can tell you the precise degree of your connection with another person. The best gauge is to be aware of how you feel in a given relationship. But while 
the characteristics are going to define your core identity. And those are typically concrete. I'm a rabbi, for example, and I value authenticity. Those ideas that define relational identity are much more abstract. Like you can say, oh, I feel like our relationship is withering away. So it's much more abstract, it's much harder. And you're gonna need a stronger core identity to be able to have a stronger relational identity. So through relational identity, you actually end up having within it, I hope I'm not losing you here, two dimensions, affiliation and autonomy. Affiliation is how close or distant you feel to someone. Affiliation is your emotional connection with a particular person. Stable, constructive connections tend to produce positive emotions. But on the flip side of affiliation is rejection. If you're rejected by someone, then even despite however strong your core identity is, you're going to feel a certain amount of resentment. It's interesting, because I was looking at this, that neuroscientists have discovered that the anguish of social rejection registers in the interior cortex. The same part of the brain that processes physical pain. Once hit, you resist cooperating. And if doing so, it goes against your rational interests. When you feel rejection, you actually feel physical pain, according to neuroscientists. And then there is autonomy. Remember, affiliation. How close or distant are you with someone? The second level is autonomy. How free are you to be who you want to be? You need both of them in the relationship. How close and distant you are with the person. But then there's the me again. How free are you able to be? Or how free do you want to be? Autonomy is your ability to exercise your will, to think, to feel, to do, to be as you would like to without any undue imposition from anyone else. Before Corona, a couple that was sitting across from me had an argument. And the wife had raised her voice. The husband immediately says, calm down. The wife glared back and she snaps. Don't tell me to calm down. You calm down. Whatever the original issue had been, this pair had a new conflict. It was now devolved into a battle over autonomy. Neither of them wanted to be told what to do. The, the moment you feel like someone is stepping on your autonomy, your resentment boils up and you snap back. So the core relational challenge is to figure out how to satisfy your desire to be simultaneously one with the other person, affiliation, and one apart from the other person, autonomy. That is this incredible balance, affiliation and autonomy. How to be one with the other person, but also apart from the other person. And how can they both coexist in your life? Because to a certain extent, they're opposites. But they are both intrinsic to any relationship. And your ability to keep them balanced is crucial to a harmonious relationship. Teenagers. If you remember when you were a teenager, if you have a teenager, you try to fit into your family, but also find your own independent voice. So I think that's a great example that that forging of a teenager, of being able to have the affiliation and autonomy. A romantic couple tries to balance the desire to connect and grow the relationship while having what they call some alone time. And I, it's interesting because now in this process of quarantine, of isolation, it's harder for that alone time than ever before. So I think that it's a great opportunity now to try to figure out that balance while it's so difficult. You're saying, well, I'll wait till everything gets back to normal. 
Well, when it's back, back to normal, then it's gonna be much harder because, because it's in your face right now, it's a great opportunity. On a deeper level, the ability to transcend the tension of autonomy and affiliation, I believe, is central. Kabbalah says it's central to life itself. God created this world. Remember how we started tonight's class? God created this world as a spiritual lust, a taiva. What was the purpose of creating this world? To make a dwelling place for him in the lowest realms. God created the ultimate autonomy for us by giving us complete free choice. Yet, at the same time, God gave us what Kabbalah calls chelak al mal mamash, an actual peace of God, affiliation. As we live our lives, we have the opportunity to use our godly soul through mitzvot to uplift this world. And at the same vein, we can use our instinct and our animal tendencies to make the wrong choices. The shallowest way to live in this natural world is governing our lives only by instinct. Once we discover our humility and learn to take our ego out of the equation, we begin to realize that the world itself is part of God's lust, which transcends autonomy and affiliation in pursuit of making this world a dwelling place for God. And so within ourselves, we also have this level of autonomy and affiliation. We have free choice and we have a piece of God within us. So we're constantly in this battle, constantly. And I think that makes it all the more valuable. I think that makes it all the more special. And that's my thoughts on Kabbalah for love, or of love for tonight.